Well, thanks very much to Nathan and Petar uh, and everyone else who's helped organise it. I'm very happy, uh, very happy to have been invited. Um, I think, so I think um, there will be a, a kind of, hopefully, a, a continuity between some of the things I say and some of the issues discussed by Alberto, or at least, hopefully, um, I'll try to kind of forge some kind of connection. Um, so, um, although the title of this paper is Sophistry Sufficient in Theory, I'm not going to say very, very much about sophistry, um, you know, any kind of definition or kind of uh, close analysis of sophistry. Um, but what I really want to talk about is the relationship between philosophy and theory. And I want to kind of, in a way, to kind of propose an account of theory as salvaging the truth implicit in sophistry. So, so, so you know, uh, theory in this kind of, uh, in a sense, kind of uh, brandished by someone like Jameson, um, who, who's the first quote on this handout. There's a, the handout features all the, 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 the principal quotes I'd like to, to go through in this paper, and there's uh, 13 of them, okay? Um, but, um, yeah, hopefully I'll speed up a bit. Um, so so this, the account of uh, theory and critical theory in its distinction to philosophy and the challenges it poses to, um, you know, the kind of... Uh, you know, the ideological and often kind of delusory legitimations and rationalizations that philosophy offers for itself. Theory in this sense would be uh, a kind of, uh, you know, a, critical, a dialectical rehabilitation of the truth of sophistry, okay? So, so the, the context, more specifically, the context of this paper is to examine a recent critique of um, radical critiques of rationality, you know, specifically genealogical critiques of rationality, uh, in, a, in a paper by Robert Brandom entitled uh, Reason, Genealogy, and the Hermeneutics of Magnanimity. And that's, uh, half of the quotes um, on the handout come from this paper. The others come from um, the manuscript of Brandom's book on Hegel, which is called The Spirit of Trust, um, which is currently online on, you know, the latest version is online on uh, Brandon's website. This is a, a book he's been working on for 20 years, and it's, it seems to be kind of uh, undergoing perpetual revision. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll be kind of, um, you know, there's a few citations from that text, which I think try, hopefully kind of consolidate or at least kind of clarify some of the, uh, you, know, the you know, the background implicit in his, um, his critical account of genealogy, okay? Um, now, I, I want, so I want to begin, first of all, by just going through this, this, the first quote, which is this, this quote from Jameson, from Frederick Jameson. It's from a 2006 review of uh, Zizek's uh, Parallax View. Um, and I, I mean, there's, there's numerous kind of, uh, Jameson, at many points in his work, does give a kind of a, articulates what he takes to be the kind of the, the distinction, what he takes to be salient in the distinction between philosophy and theory. And this is one, uh, but I think this one is, part is particularly interesting for my purpose, so I'll just read the quote. Um, the dialectic belongs to theory rather than philosophy. The latter is always haunted by the dream of some foolproof, self-sufficient system, a set of, intellect of interlocking concepts which are their own cause. This dream is, of course, the afterimage of philosophy as an institution in the world, as a profession complicit with everything else in the status quo, in the fallen, ontic realm of what is. Theory, and uh, the, um, the bold, pa I, I, I've done the bold, so it's not in, in the original text because this is the, the really crucial um, passage, I think. Theory, on the other hand, has no vested interest in as much as it never lays claim to an absolute system, a non-ideological formulation of itself and its truths. Indeed, always itself complicit in the being of current language, it has only the vocation and never finished task of undermining philosophy as such by unraveling affirmative statements and propositions of all kinds. We may put this another way by saying that the two great bodies of post-philosophical thought marked by the names of Marx and Freud are better characterized as unities of theory and practice. That is to say that their practical component always interrupts the unity of theory and prevents it from coming together in some satisfying philosophical system. 
Um, okay, so I think for Jameson, at least, you know, on this account, systematic philosophy is an avatar of theology as a discourse tending towards the fusion of reasons and causes, or explanation and justification. So in other words, the, the, uh, the delusion, the peculiar delusion of philosophy, of classical philosophy, is to be a self-sufficient rational discourse, a self-instituting, self-legitimating discourse. And of course, in, you know, metaphysics in, in the uh, Aristotelian tradition is very much this, you know, the first science, science of being qua being. It's also the, um, it quickly becomes the uh, straightforwardly convertible with, with theology. But in, this is the problem for Jameson. Um, this is what renders philosophy an apologia for the status quo at best, or a rationalization of oppression at worst. Okay? So this is why Jameson, and I don't have a quote to, kind of, uh, to back this up right now, but often you know, for Jameson, uh, philosophical truth as such, and philosophy's pretension to truth is always ideological. Um, the justifications preferred by philosophy Indeed, the ideal of justification, the Socratic ideal of justification, at the inauguration of, uh, of philosophy, is inherently suspect, okay, in some sense. Um, and practice here on this account, what James called practice, would be, it's not just the interruption of the autonomy of the conceptual, but also the non-conceptual conditioning of the conceptual, it, such that theory relays the theory in Jameson's end would relay the materialist primacy of practice, okay? So it's this, what's uh, uh, Marx and Freud particularly exemplify for Jameson is this, uh, this kind of, uh, the radicalization of um, the critical pretensions of philosophy, um, precisely which undermines the self-sufficiency of reason or of rationality by appreciating how <coughs> rationality itself is conditioned by um, economic structures, you know, libidinal forces, etc. Okay. So now, um, it's what's you know the, the three, the name that's missing in, in, in the Jameson quote is obviously Nietzsche, and obviously, uh, you know, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud were identified by Paul Ricoeur as the you know the masters of suspicion. Okay, the ones that you know the uh, the, the triumvirate who posed the greatest and deepest challenge to philosophy, to classical philosophy. Now, uh, the, um, the absence of Nietzsche's name from, from Jameson's account, I think, is interesting, and I want to kind of, and I think it's, it's significant. And actually, the primary target of Brandom's critique is actually Nietzsche and not Marx and Freud. So w one of the things I want to make clear to, to kind of obviate any possible misunderstanding is like, my aim here is not simply to pit philosophy against theory or to kind of do some kind of, uh, to stage some kind of revenge of philosophy on theory. Um, the point is not to reify the distinction between philosophy and theory, but to, 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 to achieve a probably dialectical articulation of philosophy and theory such that the, you know, philosophy is conditioned by philosophy, um, philosophy is conditioned by theory, which challenges its autonomy, but at the same time, um, theory itself is the self-consciousness of philosophy, um, just as philosophy would be the self-consciousness of theory. Um, so the target, um, now I think why is Nietzsche not uh, amongst, uh, not cited alongside Marx and Freud? Well, because there's a, there's a sense in which uh, Nietzsche's genealogical enterprise challenges the very possibility, the very conditions of theorizing as such. Genealogy then would be the skeptical exacerbation of theory. It marks the point at which theory turns its critical resources against its own residual rationalism. So this, this is what pits Nietzsche against Marx and Freud. And where enlightenment disenchanted the world through reason, and in a sense both Marx and Freud radicalized enlightenment to the extent that they engage in a theoretical description and explanation which critically delimits the purview of reason, genealogy is disillusionment with reason. And the trajectory then would be from rational explanation up to and including the critical demarcation of the limits and scope of rationality, i.e. its heteronomy in, in Marx and Freud, to the, you know, the Nietzschean unmasking of reason's explanatory pretensions. Okay. Now, two things, but note that the critical unmasking of rational justification as ideological 
rationalization, continues to presuppose the intelligibility of justification, albeit as absent or unrealized. Okay? Theory, then, would be the counter-philosophical legitimation of sophistry, and this is its enduring salience. So the dialectical conjecture that you know, I want to kind of you know, uh, investigate is that the globalization, it's precisely the kind of, in a way, there's a, what, what theory must um, resist is a temptation to globalize uh, suspicion um, to the point where genealogical disillusionment turns into an illusory enchantment. And this is a problem when, in the Nietzschean accounts, in the Nietzschean fable, how the true world became, uh, how the true world became a fable, I think it's called, is in Twilight of the Idols, is that right? Uh, um, it's, it's actually quoted by Barbara yesterday, is that once you do away um, with, uh, is that the opposition between reality and appearance itself lapses and becomes null and void. Uh, once you start, um, um, I can't remember the Nietzschean formulation. Um, yes, yes. Once, basically, um, th th there was a specific um, formulation I had in mind. It's, I'll hope, I'll, I'll, hopefully, I'll remember it. Okay, um, but the point is that um, the conditions for ideology critique lapse in a genealogical account where there's no longer anything like the distinction between, not between truth and falsity, but b b b between reality and illusion. Uh, so, theory then aims to query the pretension to autonomy claimed by systematized propositional assertion. It challenges the autonomy and hence the authority of the logos. And it, to that extent it relays, um, you know, the kind of, the, the, uh, the challenge that the, the sophist poses to the philosopher. But in order to specify the nature of this challenge, we must distinguish between asserting and asserted, or believing and believed, okay? between act and content. So theory undermines the autonomy or the rational sufficiency of the asserted, of, the cont of what is believed in, by showing how its assertion is causally conditioned by non-propositional factor, uh, forces, whether libidinal, economic, or, or what have you. So this is then why Genealogy is a causal etiology of, of rationality. And this is the second quote um, on the handout from Brandom. Okay, so genealogical explanations concern the relations between the act or state of believing and the content that is believed. A genealogy explains the advent of a belief in the sense of a believing, an attitude, in terms of contingencies of its etiology, appealing exclusively to facts that are not evidence that do not provide reasons or justifications for the truth of what is believed. So, what aspects of rationality does genealogy specifically challenge? Well, first, it challenges um, the, the Enlightenment um, pretension to have, um, you know, to have discovered um, you know, sorry, a rational legitimation of authority. So the, the revision of the understanding of authority as superior power, superior potency, invested in an individual person or role or object, into the authority of the better reason, which is impersonal and accessible by all. So genealogy challenge queries the objectivity and universality of what Brandom calls normative statuses, okay? entitlements, uh, obligations, things that um, um, the, the structural components of the game that he describes as the game of giving and asking for reasons. So, genealogy exposes the authority of reason as simply another iteration of the superiority of force. Um, pou but pouvoir not puissance. Force in the, in the French term would be pouvoir not puissance. Okay? So, um, now, I'm going to try to kind of basically um, resume um, the steps of, of, of uh, uh, Brandon's critique. Um, and I want to do this in a way because, um, in a way that uh, brings out what is peculiar and interesting about his, um, his reconstruction, his attempted reconstruction of Hegel. Uh, because it's actually, at the end of the paper, it's really the issue about, um, I want to, you know, to, to focus on um, whether 
how and if it's possible to be a Hegelian today and what's at stake in the reactualization of Hegel um, as the greatest proponent of um, the rationalistic pretensions of philosophy. Okay, but what are, what are the steps of Brandon's critique of, of genealogy? Um, first of all, um, Branham's critique, okay, Branham's reconstruction of Hegel, um, which provides the context in which his critique of genealogy unfolds, um, is predicated on the, on the conceit that it's possible to reconstruct uh, the maximally normative uh, scope of rationality in its full-blooded Hegelian sense from a minimalist and non-normative account of inference. This is what inferentialism is, okay? Brandom is an inferentialist. Inferentialism defends the primacy of material inference um, over formal inference as the minimal or non-normative core of rationality, okay? So what does this mean? Um, it's, a, it's an attempted kind of, uh, first, it's a kind of an extension of Kantian's uh, discursive deflation of metaphysical rationality. Uh, rationality is not um, an innate capacity. It's something that is embedded and, you know, um, incarnated in our linguistic practices. Um, how does this basic, you know, how is it kind of uh, elaborated or unfolded? First of all, the base level is the conversion of causal association into logical deduction. So in other words, the inferential account does not, it doesn't, pr um, project logic uh, into, um, uh, into reality or into kind of social practices. It shows how um, the, the ability to kind of the causal conjunction or disjunction of representations or psychological states um, leads to the explicit representation of conjunction or disjunction, okay? So first of all, you have um, the story is, is told in its most basic form in, in the work of Wilfred Sellers, who, dis, who, distinguishes, who, who distinguishes types of animal representational system. So first of all, all animals have the capacity to associate representations. Fire, smoke. Um, there's some kind of, all, if one presumes some basic, you know, uh, neurophysiological mechanism to ensure the association of representations, then um, it's possible to have um, a higher order mechanism which will represent the relations between representations. And this is all that logic is, okay? This is why um, the move is from the conjunction or disjunction of representations to the representation of conjunction or disjunction, okay? So, um, this is what, Kind of, this is the kind of the uh, the structural kind of a bedrock of inferentialism. Okay, so what does it say that um, humans do? Humans engage in the game of giving and asking for reasons. Okay, um, propositional assertions are inferentially articulated because to be able to give a reason, we must be able to make a claim that can serve as a reason for another claim. Hence, our language must provide for sentences that entail other sentences. And it follows then that to be able to ask for reasons, we must be able to make claims that count as a challenge to other claims. Hence, our language must provide for sentences that are incompatible with other sentences. Uh, th this is why the kind of uh, the basic inferential theme is that language is structured by entailment and incompatibility relations. Um, Okay, so semantic content on this uh, inferential account is individuated by the rules governing material inferences. Material inferences such as from it is raining to the streets are, are wet. These rules are constitutive of the meaning of linguistic expressions. They are not just something derived from, from or applied to pre-existing semantic units. Moreover, purely logical or formal inference is merely the rendering explicit, or you know, the explicitation of relations of discursive commitment, entitlement, and incompatibility, these being the three basic species of, uh, of inferential articulation, um, that are already implicit in everyday perception, reasoning, and action. Okay? 
So in Brandon's word, logic is merely the organ of semantic self-consciousness. Okay, so it's not that you don't have a form content distinction. Um, you have this base level of material inference, okay, um, in which um, the, you know, the basic inferential nexus is implicit. And then logical, formal inference as we understand it is basically the higher order, um, I don't want to say representation, representation is not the right word, the higher order explicitation of these um, you know, relations of uh, uh, commitment, uh, entitlement, and incompatibility between propositional assertions. Okay. This is to say that discursive rationality is more basic than logic, which presupposes it. It also implies that what we mean is indissociable from what we do, i.e. from our everyday practical purposes. And since these purposes are embedded in a social context, this means that our rationality, understood as our ability to give and ask for reasons for what we do and say, cannot simply be abstracted from the social practices in which this ability is embedded. This is to say that discursive rationality cannot be dissociated from practical, and which for Brandon means social rationality. So, this is um, the kind of, a, I think this would be the force of uh, this non-metaphysical reconstruction of rationalism. Rationality is sedimented in socially embodied discursive practices. Okay, okay. now, um, okay. Hegel, sorry, Brandom um, is, will try to give an account in which he thinks um, genealogical kind of, uh, the genealogical um, critique of rationality is uh, vitiated by an abstraction, an abstraction from this kind of uh, uh, the social embeddedness of uh, rational discursive practices. Um, and he claims that this um, critique is, um, comes from failing to um, recognize the distinction between um, what he calls attitudes and statuses. Okay. So um, in the, uh, the pre-modern um, social formations, according to Brandon, uh, which are governed by ethical life, um, normative status are, are taken to, have an, uh, to be objectively real and they have an authority over um, our, the attitudes, the, belie you know, the, the beliefs that we have towards them. Okay? So, this is the third quote on the handout. What Brandon calls cyclicite, which is obviously kind of his reconstruction of this Hegelian term, cyclicite requires a particular kind of acknowledgement of the authority of the norms over the normative attitudes of, practic of practitioners. The willingness to sacrifice, and take it that others ought to sacrifice, attitudes and inclinations that are out of step with the norms. That is identifying with the norms, okay? So to identify with norms is to claim that norms are, are real, are objectively real. Uh, and, you know, this is, uh, it's, if you believe in natural law, this is what you're committed to. You're, cl you're claiming that um, reality has, an has a, a normative structure, okay? Um, what happens in the transition from uh, you know, the pre-modern to the modern um, philosophical kind of uh, understanding of, of normativity is that um, the objectivity of norms is undermined by the realization that um, these norms are fundamentally constituted by our beliefs and desires, by our attitudes towards them. Okay. <coughs> So, in other words, modernity begins with the primacy of subjective normative attitudes over these allegedly objective normative statuses. And this is, um, quote, four on the handout. One cannot properly understand normative statuses, such as commitment, responsibility, authority, um, and correctness, apart from their relation to normative attitudes, recognizing others by taking or treating them as committed, responsible, authoritative, or acting correctly or incorrectly. That practical <coughs> realization is the motor of modernity. This is a very, very strong claim. Um, in other words, it's the, uh, the realization that norms are, we create or we manufacture norms. They are not metaphysical entities existing independently of us. Okay. 
Um, it falls then on, on Brandon's account that alienation is the structural denial that subjective attitudes are responsible to norms which, as authoritative, count as independent of those attitudes. Okay? In other words, that um, we can't be held responsible to uh, normative status, statuses that we have not uh, instituted. Um, so, the, then the, the problem then becomes the articulation of um, authority and responsibility. Okay, there's um, um, the whole the logic of Branham's account is about understanding the, the dialectical interplay between authority and responsibility. Okay, what is what does this mean? I mean, what has authority is a normative state status. Okay, what you're uh, committed to, entitled to, etc., or obliged to do. Um, what you're, um, and, and, and in that regard, you are responsible to that which hold, exercises authority over you. Okay? So the relationship is one of dependence. The normative status is independent, um, but your obligation renders you dependent upon that norm. Okay? Then in modernity, you've got a switch such that modernity, the subjectivism of modernity, um, proceeds from the realization that in fact, um, we, it's our, um, our own uh, attitudes, okay, that constitute these norms. So the norms are dependent upon our attitudes, okay. And then the question is, are these attitudes themselves independent, okay, or not? And, and the genealogy says, no, they are not, okay. So norms are dependent, are constituted by attitudes. Norms of status are constituted by, by attitudes. Um, so you've got the, the, the relation of dependency is switched. It's now norms are dependent on attitudes. But attitudes themselves, okay, can either be taken to be independent, okay, self-legitimating, or they can themselves be taken to be conditioned by uh, non-normative causal factors, okay. Um, so this is why the problem is... Um, on quote number five now, on the handout. So the problem then becomes, as, as Branham says, of understanding how can the responsibility of subjective normative attitudes, what is acknowledged as correct, to normative status, what really is correct, be reconciled with the authority of subjective normative attitudes over normative statuses. Any social, institutional, or conceptual context that forces a choice between these is an alienated one. Okay. So... Um, Alienation is being forced with the choice of um, absolutizing some, uh, of being unable to kind of to adjudicate uh, the relationship between uh, dependence and independence. Um, and he takes, um, and Brandom now takes Hegel to be posing a fundamental challenge to this, to this dichotomy, okay? Um, and I'm going to, um, okay, read quote six, which is a lengthy quote, um, which I think is quite important, okay? Um, Branham takes Hegel to be demolishing Kant's two-stage theory of conceptual content. The Kantianism is vitiated by uh, a dichotomy of content and application, or, or semantics and epistemology. So, Branham writes, Hegel reads Kant as having a two-stage story. Transcendental activity is the source of the conceptual norms that then govern empirical discursive activity. So in other words, if you want to explain what generates these, um, you know, these norms, there has to be some kind of, it's either an empirical source or a transcendental source. Can opts for the transcendental source, okay? And the empirical self accordingly always already finds itself with a stock of determinate concepts. And the transcendental processes by which discursive norms are instituted are sharply distinguished from the empirical processes in which those discursive norms are applied. In the 20th century, Rudolf Carnap um, provides an index example of this Kantian two-stage semantic epistemic explanatory strategy. In his version, the two stages correspond to beginning by fixing meanings and only then fixing beliefs. The first semantic stage is selecting a language. The second epistemic stage is selecting a theory, a set of sentences couched in that language that are taken to be true. His student Quine objected to Carnap that while this two-stage procedure makes perfect sense for formal or artificial languages, it makes no sense for natural languages. 
all speakers do is use the language. Or as Kant would say, make judgments. That use must somehow determine both what their expressions mean and which sentences they take to be true. And the vocabulary I use to talk about Kant, the use of language to express judgments must be understood as affecting both the institution of conceptual norms and their application. Okay, so it's this... Two, so, hey, Branham's argument is really very simple. He just says um, the globalization of genealogy is mortgaged to this um, two-stage account of uh, semantic... Um, this two-stage semantics, basically, um, which assumes that you can... There's a way of, like... Uh, that you can somehow dissociate the fixation of semantic content from, uh, you know, the epistemic adjudication of whether or not these contents apply to the world, so the, to the empirical domain. And this is what he calls semantic naivety, okay? So, semantic naivety consists in, has three aspects. First, the determination of the, the assumption that the determination of semantic content is prior to and independent of the application of that content in the exercise of epistemic judgment. Secondly, it assumes that what things mean is independent of how things are. And more fundamentally, it assumes that meaning or semantics is independent of use or pragmatics. Okay? So this is the, these are the, kind of the, the three facets of semantic naivety, according to Randall. Okay? So Hegel's kind of um, fundamental achievement is to, kind of, to be the first to recognize, to overcome this kind of, uh, this crippling dichotomy. Okay? Um, and to acknowledge uh, the reciprocal constitution of application and institution, of the application of concepts and the institution of concepts, okay? It's not the case you cannot um, institute a concept and then apply it. Um, the institution coincides with the application and vice versa. And this is Hegel's great insight, according to, to Brandon. So therefore, this is quote number seven, okay? Our discursive activity does not consist either in simply applying conceptual norms that are somehow given to us, nor in distinct and separable activities of first instituting or establishing those norms and then applying them. Rather, our discursive practices of judging and acting intentionally must be seen as both the application and the institution of determinately contentful conceptual norms. Um, the immediate consequence of this, of this Hegelian insight, according to Brandon, is the, acknowledging the reciprocity of responsibility and authority, or the dialectical articulation of dependence and independence. So Hegel asserts the co-constitution of attitude and norm, or responsibility and authority, in the form of the reciprocity between individual and community, such that the individual's responsibility towards the community, her dependence, her dependence on a community which is independent, whose authority is independent of her, is also at the, and at the same time the community's <laughs> responsibility towards the individual. The, de the community's dependence on the individual and the individual's in independence. Okay. So, and here's a quote from, uh, from Hegel from the Phenomenology that Brandon marshals to kind of, you know, to, kind of uh, to consolidate this, this claim. So this is Hegel here. What appears here as the power and authority of the individual exercised over the substance and what substance here is the, uh, the spiritual substance, the, you know, the, the, the community itself, um, which is thereby superseded, is the same thing as the actualization of the substance. Um, for the power of the individual consists in conforming itself to that substance, i.e. in externalizing its own self and thus establishing itself as substance that has an objective existence. Its culture and its own actuality are therefore the actualization of the substance itself. Um, okay, so um, this is so. On Hegel's account, then, as reconstructed by Branham, every description of an attitude towards a semantic content, which is a, a normative status, presupposes the normative responsibility of that very description. Otherwise, not only would it remain indeterminate whether or not the description is correct, it would not even be possible to characterize it as the description of an attitude, i.e. a belief. Okay. Um, so, 
this is simply to say that um, um, it's impossible. So, in other words, you need to have um, you know you need to have some account of semantic content to be able to describe the attitudes that believers have towards those contents. This, this is the reciprocal constitution of um, you know the propositional attitude of, of the believing and the believed. Okay, you can't. In fact, they're both aspects of a single indissociable. Um, unity on this account. Um, and here, okay, and now I, I get, to, so this is the crux of Brandon's critique of, uh, of genealogy. So this is quote number nine. Global genealogical reductive explaining a way of norms in favor of attitudes. In other words, the claim that all norms are conditioned by attitudes, okay, um, attitudes which are themselves just kind of embedded in the causal order, okay, presumes that it, that it, it, it is intelligible for the contents of propositional attitudes to stay in place after normative reason relations amongst their judgeable contents are relinquished. Otherwise, what is being explained genealogically can no longer be understood as believings, as attitudes of taking things to be, or representing them as thus and so. If our attitudes were not genuinely conceptually contentful, then we would not even be purporting to represent things as being thus and so, and things would not even seem to us to be thus and so. So, if disillusionment about the reality of norms of reasoning entails semantic nihilism, then it is self-defeating. The genealogist's claims would entail that her own claims are senseless. Okay, um, okay so now, I'm going, okay, uh, this account is not, okay, this will, have prob this will turn out to have problematic implications, but um, at least I'll follow, what immediately follows from this, um, according to Brandom, is a kind of objective idealism, okay? Objective idealism being, well, well, quote number um, 10, um, the tag for the claim that there is a reciprocal sense dependence relation between the concepts that articulate our grasp of the objective world, object, property, fact, law, incompatibility, and here he means objective incompatibility, incompatibility amongst objects, on the one hand, and the concepts that articulate our grasp of the practices of knowing and acting subjects, singular term, predicate, asserting, inferring, incompatibility, subjective. Okay. So this is what objective idealism means, according to, to Brandon. It means that the conditions of objectivation and therefore of theorization, including the critical articulations of reasons and causes, including saying that a subjective attitude is causally determined by an object in the world, um, presuppose, the relationship between asserted and asserting, presuppose this double articulation um, of, of, um, of believing and believed. Okay. Um, so, um, Okay, I'll move on. I'm going to move. Um, it's taking quite long. I'm going to kind of try and speed up a bit and just move to the kind of the final stages of um, Brandon's critique. So, um, the next quote on the handout, okay, is that understanding genealogical analysis as undercutting the claims of reason, the rational bindingness of conceptual norms depends on assessing the rationality of discursive practice solely on the basis of the extent to which the application of concepts, whose contents are construed as always already fully determinate, are responsive exclusively to evidential concerns. Responsiveness of concept application to any factors that are contingent relative to the conceptual norms already in force, which is the phenomenon gene genealogical diagnosis highlight, is accordingly identified as irrationality. Okay. But the idea that assessments of rationality are appropriately addressed only to the application of already <coughs> fully determinate concepts is the product of a blinkered semantic naivety. It ignores the fact that the very same discursive practice that is from one point of view the application of conceptual norms is from another point of view the institution of those norms and the determination of their contents. Okay? So, I'll cut, you know, uh, I won't read the final sentence. It's just a reiteration of what I've already said. Okay, so he includes, he, he includes the genealogist of taking a, a one-sided, um, of adopting a one-sided perspective 
uh, on the relationship between believings and believed, or between attitudes and norms. Okay. So, what then follows from this? I mean, if, you, if, you, if one thinks um, in terms of uh, a, a radical kind of holism, a radical semantic holism, okay, um, in which um, you know the only what we call truth, truth could only be uh, the true is the whole as the processual unity of the application, institution, and determination of these three moments, which are indissociable. So, and the consequence, and I think ultimately the kind of the, uh, the problematic consequence of this account is that it seems, or at least on Brandon's account, that a culture becomes a minimum unity, a community, a linguistic community, becomes a minimum unit units of interpretation insofar as it provides the substantial form in terms of which assertions are recognizable as acts. Okay. Um, now, what is this... Um, how does uh, reason make progress? If you, or rather, how does reason... Um, come to kind of incorporate, uh, if the false is a moment of the true, how does reason come to retrospectively incorporate uh, what was contingent, inessential, and false into the conceptual determination of what is necessary, ineluctable, and true? Okay. And Brandom um, chooses, I think, a very kind of uh, an instructive but also um, problematic paradigm. The, par the paradigm um, he identifies is uh, common law, the practice of common law, as w exemplifying what he calls the rationalization of contingency. Um, this is quote number 12, okay? Um, rational or rationalizing processes of this sort, of exemplified by, by common law, are responsible to the contents of the conceptual norms they apply, and they exercise authority over the development of those conceptual contents. They are processes of determining conceptual contents, both in the sense of finding out what they are, manifested in the essentially retrospective rationales judges supply for their decisions, and in the sense of making those contents what they are, manifested in the essentially prospective shifting and sharpening of the norms each new interpretation proposes. This is, and what Branham calls it, this hermeneutic practice gives contingency the normative form of necessity and by incorporating those contingencies, infuses determinate content into the developing norms. It is, a, it, it is of the essence of the kind of rationality distinctive of this sort of concept determining process to be articulated by these complementary perspectives. Retrospective determining as finding and perspective determining as making. Responsibility to the tradition one inherits and authority over the tradition one bequeaths. So, Okay, so dialectics then is the internalization of exteriority, or the conversion of contingency into necessity, through the constructive extension of a rule to incorporate what seemed to be an anomaly. Okay, um, and it's this the rationalization of the contingent determination of acts of assertion, um, which becomes integral to the rationality of what is asserted, to the rationality of the of, of the content of the assertion. Um, okay, I'm going to skip um, the final quotes, okay, just to focus on, um, simply because it's, it's, you know, it's, it doesn't really add much, uh, and I'm, I don't want to kind of talk for too much longer. Um, now, what is the, um, what can we conclude from this account, okay? Um, First of all, um, that if the task of philosophy is to render explicit the conceptual norms implicit in discursive practice and to identify contradictions at the level of theoretical discourse, then it's also bound to expose the contradictions or incompatibilities between theoretical norms and practical norms, as well as incompatibilities pitting various practical norms against each other. Okay? So because rationality, according to Brandom, is indissociably conceptual and social, theoretical rationality is inseparable from practical rationality in the broadest sense, okay, which encompasses every variety of human practice, whether material or intellectual. Okay? 
And this is what could be called the counter-normative thrust of critical rationality on this kind of Brandomian account. Okay. But the consequence okay, is, is that philosophy cannot hold sociocultural norms accountable to an allegedly superior tribunal of pure reason. All it can do is hold so these norms accountable to their own implicit criteria of rationality by rendering explicit both their conceptual inconsistencies and their practical incompatibilities. And in doing so, according to Brandom, it would exert the minimum degree of discursive pressure required to initiate the process of revising and ultimately transforming both social and cultural practices. Okay, now, here is where the obvious problem with this account, I think, manifests itself. Okay, this is a form, if you think about this, so this is a form of holism, of semantic and epistemic holism, okay, uh, where a form of life then becomes the basic unit of understanding. Okay? Only someone who is, and if, you know, in, in the example that Brandon gives, the obvious thing one starts to worry about is that, yes, uh, the judge, you know, there's this retrospective rationalization of um, you know, decisions, this attempt to, kind of to, to identify a rule or a principle that is implicit in these, um, you know, the contingencies of these previous cases, okay, and, and Brandon says that this is, this is actually kind of the dialectical articulation of uh, necessity and contingency, that contingency, this is the sense in which contingency is only ever a moment of necessity, okay, um, but the problem is that it implies a fundamental conservatism, it seems to rule out the possibility of challenging the discursive practice, okay, or the, the you know, the, the rule or, pra or, you know, the, um, the practice by which you identify uh, the relevant precedents, okay? And this is, it seems that this is kind of, you know, this is highly kind of uh, dubious on the face of it. Because it, it implies that the, the conservatism of what Brandon calls the hermeneutics of magnanimity, okay? Precisely insofar as Vernum, for reason, then becomes a form of life, okay? And it's the wholeness of Vernumph, this that is that becomes a problem for it pre precludes us challenging the form of life in this allegedly integrated wholeness. Okay. Um, so, um, in other words, um, the problem with this account of rationality is that it's uh, it's attractive because because of its minimalism, um, because. Um, of the way in which um, it seems to kind of uh, give an elaboration, you know, you know, an understanding of the kind of the interconnectedness of uh, of reason and practice, uh, so that practice in this sense is no longer um, something that is external to um, the uh, the game of giving and asking for reasons. Okay, um, but the problem then is this. Um, the it seems to me the excessive organicis, or, or excessive organicism of this um, of, 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 the, of understanding the, the way in which the uh, you know the dialectical interpenetration of dependence and independence, okay. um, and it seems fundamentally to rule out the possibility of any kind of uh, you know so. It limits the degree to which you can call into questions, you can call into question the complicity between, um, you know, instituted, you know, um, the institutions of a f that, are, that are constitutive of a form of life uh, and various forms of, of injustice, okay? It, I mean, to cut, you know, very simply, it just seems to kind of, you know, entail a kind of a, um, a reformism at best, okay? So, um, now this is where I think, so, um, the problem then and is, I think that Badiou is interesting in this regard, um, because I think that what is interesting in, in, uh, in Badiou's kind of Hegelianism, or his residual Hegelianism, is um, an attempt to kind of understand uh, the conditions under which um, you can have rationality, can compel um, can recognize the dysfunctioning, okay, in um, the, the structure, you know, the kind of, the transcendental structure 
uh, that conditions these uh, various forms of practices. Um, in other words, they would allow you to, al to identify a dysfunction in the consistency of the totality. Okay. Um, now, the, the question then is whether it's possible to kind of um, to identify a criterion of recognizability that would allow you to identify these moments of dysfunction. Okay. Um, and actually, I'm just. I mean, there's a. I had something written about this, but I've just realised that there's a. A missing, uh, a, th a missing paragraph here. Um, so it's kind of uh, annoying because it's. Uh, so um, okay, what, what I what I simply mean to say is this: is that um, here, Brandom's account seems, in spite of its, um, you know, scrupulousness as regards avoiding, um, you know, the. Uh, the metaphysical inflation of rationality doesn't seem to avoid uh, the um, the seduction of the the sufficiency of philosophical rationality precisely because you know it, 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 it acknowledges the, the, the interconnectedness of rationality and sociality but only at the cost of turning um, you know integrated social forms into the condition of rationality and this is problematic because, it, first of all, because it, it, it assumes a problematic continuity between um, wholeness or unity or consistency and rationality, and it precludes the kinds of ruptures, I think, that I think Badiou rightly associates with the most radical uh, potencies of rationality. Okay? Um, the problems I see it being that, that Badiou then doesn't give a a kind of a meta-theoretical account of the conditions of, of, of rationality because he tethers it to this kind of uh, mathematical uh, condition. Um, so I think that, um, you know, what I take to be, or rather what, I, what I'm interested in doing, okay, what I'm, what I'm basically interested in doing is seeing whether it's possible, um, whether, whether, what Badiou calls the articulation of being an event is a way of articulating, and in fact, you know, Philosophy's conditioning by eventual truths is um, actually kind of an acknowledgement of uh, the way in which philosophy depends upon um, its own sophistical subversion in order to prevent it from simply, um, you know, ratifying um, and, and can consolidating um, what is the existing state of things. Um, I, there's, yeah, I'll stop here. There's no point in me kind of blabbering on. So. Um.